up on the sitting on the counter, and I'll be right back. Uh, Brother Lovett has our lesson. We're teaching. Wait, you dare leave and, and let me I'll talk be, about you while I'll, you're gone? You can talk Great. about him all you all want right. while I'm gone. Right, let's talk about our president. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Lovett, uh, we're doing uh, Elder uh, President Irene's talk, is that correct? Well, it's up here. Well, I did this in whatever way I did. Quickly be searching on your phone. I'll, I'll be back in less than five minutes. Yeah, I have a question for you, brother. You know, you get these emails probably every other week from somebody at our forum that says we have a, a conference talk. What's your general uh, impression when you get that email? Do you read it? Do you even know who it's from? Anybody remember the name? Who the email's from? Carter. Carter? Who's Carter? Uh, Ryan. Ryan. Ryan Carter. Well, no, wait a minute. I have a former presidency member sharing that with me. He knew. Well, I expected him to know. President Kratzer, I expected him to know because he knows everybody in this forum. Is that right? I'm Michael Levitt. I'm glad you're here, President Kratzer, to check on me and report back. It takes about eight months when they change the presidency. Yeah. The people you or whatever. No. Uh, they kind of find out what that name is. Okay. Okay. Find it in your junk mail. But when you when you get that email, how many of you read it? Seriously, by show of hands, how many of you read it? You got five people, six, seven, eight people, nine. You read your own. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right, I want you to stand up for a moment because I like putting people on the spot. Come on up here. This is a good brother. I need you to know that about him. I have no idea what his position is in the quorum. I have no idea what his calling is. I really don't. But I know he's a good brother. Take a look at him. Okay. I have no idea how he picks who's teaching today. I'm not the quorum instructor. <laughs> you pray about it? Well, Do, no, I mean, if, if he comes towards you and shakes your hand one Sunday, does that put you on the list? Okay, so you don't need to avoid him. He's still a good brother. It was the same as last year. Uh -huh. uh, it went. Brother Els, Carol Hill, and Mike Levin. So it's the same thing. <laughs> well, and, 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 and what? When you said, there are some. No, I when, you, when you give a request, do people deny your request? Sorry, do you I teach? Those things. Some don't feel like that. Some don't feel comfortable. Yes, they're not. Some don't feel comfortable. Like Perfect. Uh, and I'm one of those. And you're, stay, you're staying up here. You're staying up here for a moment. I watched everybody come into the quorum today. I watched everybody come in. And everybody, probably 80% of you have strategically seated yourself so that you can depart quickly. You really have. Edge seats, you know, end or, or far away. People like the wall, somehow leaning up against the wall. It must be warm over there, cold over there. I don't know what it is. Maybe they want the spirit to not reach them. Maybe, or maybe it goes out and around and comes down the walls. I'm not sure how it works. But when you thought of church today, was there another brother in our quorum that you were hoping to see in quorum that you could sit next to and jabber with for a moment? How many of you right now are sitting alone or with space between you and another brother and you really don't even know what's going on in that good brother's life? You may not even know their name. You may be on a roll all alone. Or did you wake up today and go, man, I can't wait to see Brother Carter, to put him on the spot like this and have him sit next to me during the forum meeting. I can't wait to see Brother Hill so I can just jabber with him because he's such a good man. I can't wait to see Drew in the back corner because I love him. He was on a baseball team I coached and then that kid could pitch. He had a wrist that could flick that ball. Eight to ten miles an hour quicker than any other young man. You don't know Drew back in the corner. He's got his own cross to bear. But you don't want to bear his cross. And trust me, Drew doesn't want to bear mine either. But good brother in the back corner if you don't know Drew. Let's get into the talk, shall we? You want to sit down? I guess so. All right, good, good. Are you coming back or are you talking about All right. He's having the same presidency member sitting next to him. See, he strategically positioned himself so he could book. But isn't it interesting? Where did the state presidency brother sit this morning? He came in late and he strategically looked around the room and he said, Where can I sit so I'm part of this forum? He found 
and MTC sat between two brethren that put him like this, like in the middle airplane seat. Who wants that middle airplane seat? None of us. But he sat right there. Good example. You didn't even know I'd be putting you on the spot today, did you? Okay, I've given you enough time. You've looked this up. You've all got it on your phones. Many of you are right now going through it going, I need to look up something so when Brother Levitt calls on me, I can sound intelligent, like I've got bullets in my gun. <laughs> Others of you read it this week, listened to it this week, and are quite familiar with the topic. And to add that, goes knowing that most of you are busily reading, we'll go right to the end. We're going to go to the end, and it's going to be the final testimony, which I love. When first presidency members give, especially as they age in years, what is their final testimony to us? And in here, we're going to find four key points how the Holy Ghost can be our constant companion. And we'll listen to it, because I should have it here on audio. Be kind of quiet, but I have this, this speaker that I'll be able to broadcast it. Hopefully it works here right off the bat, but let's try it. I testify that the Lord has kept his promise. The Holy Ghost is being sent to the faithful, covenant members of the Church of Jesus Christ. Now your experiences will be unique, and the Spirit will guide in the way best suited to your faith and capacity to receive revelation. For you, and for those you love and serve. I pray with all my heart that your confidence will grow. I bear my witness that God the Father lives. He loves you. He hears your every prayer. Jesus Christ did pray to the Father to send the Holy Ghost to guide Comfort. Oh, 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 oh. I test this Christ did pray to the Father to send the Holy Ghost to guide, comfort, and testify of truth to us. The Father and his beloved Son appeared to Joseph Smith in a grove of trees. The prophet Joseph translated the Book of Mormon by the gift and power of God. Heavenly messengers restored priesthood geese. President Russell M. Nelson is the prophet of God for all the earth. As a witness of Jesus Christ, I know that he lives and he leads his church. You and I have the opportunity to have the Holy Ghost as our constant companion and to have those truths confirmed as we remember and love the Savior, repent and ask for his love to be in our hearts. I pray that we may have that blessing and the companionship of the Holy Spirit this day and every day of our lives. I love you. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. If you felt a calming over you, with the Spirit confirming to you. And you probably got lost in his word. His cadence has slowed down, but is strategic. <clears throat> and hidden in there, because by the time you probably got there, you didn't even realize he was going to give you four strategic keys to have the Holy Ghost as your constant companion. You want to look through that little last part of the talk. Share with me. One of the first ones. Good. If you haven't looked through it, if you didn't follow along, or you didn't hear, or you didn't pick up, did anybody pick up on what one of the keys is? Remember? Remember? 
but remember what? That's the key. This is interesting, but I know, no, no, you, you, you heard it. So it says, remember, but remember what? Remember what? Okay. You skipped one. What was it? You skipped one. Right? 
even though it's completely recovered. What else do I have, Drew? Uh, see, Drew is thankful that, that uh, <laughs> I pre-warned him. <laughs> I pre-warned him I was going to call him on him. Now I'm getting flashbacks. Yeah. yeah. Fishy. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you wear as an official? Your helmet. The mask. Oh, yeah. And we're all. Armor all getting all the dust out of it, so it is just pristine looking. Straps look good, everything organized. That's a well. Uh, come on, come on, dude. What else? Oh, absolutely. I got a cup on underneath there, even though I'm behind the catcher. That ball seems to bounce underneath the catcher and come up and strike in the privates. That'll call you to repentance, absolutely. What else, Drew? Shoes? Polished. Polished. Not a speck, not a scratch, not a anything. When I walked on, those shoes looked good. When I walked off, they still looked great. To feel. The other thing, interesting, shin guards. Why would I clean my shin guards? Any idea? Why? Yes. There could be turf or rocks that could get inside it and could easily stick to it. And if it gets to your legs or your shins, it'll basically brush against it and it could cause a rash. Or if you had some from the last game that you did on a normal field, get that out of there. Yes? Have to check your equipment to make sure it's in good repair. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's not a crack. It's going to be okay. So my shin guard, do you think I got the little $29 pair? You didn't. Um, okay. No. It's good to have all those things solid enough that you can wear them time after time and you're protected. Time after time. And the best you can possibly afford. And if you're doing it 700 games a year, whew, you should have the funds to be able to buy the absolute best. Interesting on the shin guard. I went back and watched video. That video takes everything. When you come down and you're at the plate stance and that ball is coming straight at you, when you go like this, what do your pants do? Down around your feet? They lift up. Did you know that the bottom little corner of the shin guards shows? I didn't realize that. I thought they could be as dirty as anything. Nobody would know. Here I am. And every time I go down, what does the crowd see? Man, I got to get dirty. Bottom shin guard. That guy doesn't care about himself. Gives away the credibility. We have control over certain things in our life. Look back up here. What do we have control over if we want the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost? President, you came today. You didn't know what we were talking about. You didn't phone up. You didn't read ahead of time. But you got the list of the present item. Which, I don't know if you noticed, did anybody notice something I did wrong up here? Yes. Oh, gee whiz. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Who noticed that? Yeah, detailed I, person. I was say. Detailed person. <laughs> but as you look at this up here, President, uh, what do we have control over when it comes to the constant companionship of the Holy Ghost? Um, <clears throat> you don't have to list them all off. Yeah. So I'm. I'm thinking about, um, in, in my life, um, I'm trying to think celestial um, constantly. I'm trying to tell myself, you know, Tay, are you thinking disparaging things about anybody? Right? Um, and can't you be more... Do you have control over those thoughts? I do. You do, don't you? Yeah, it's pretty condemning. Do you have control whether you love the Savior? Do you have control over that? Do you have control if you remember, you even remember the Savior? Do you have control over your repentance? Acknowledgement? Doing something about it? Do you have control whether you're asking? You have complete control. Yes. Where are you? In, are you in you here? Just talk here. <laughs> I no, no, I'll take you there. Where, where are you? Right there. Okay. <laughs> 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 my 
here on my phone. Can you <laughs> yeah, yeah. President Eyring says in one paragraph, if you want to receive the companionship of the Holy Ghost, you must want it for the right reasons. Your purposes must be the Lord's purposes. If your motives are too selfish, you will find it difficult to receive and sense the promptings of the Spirit. So he says, you have to want the companionship of the Holy Ghost and want it for the right reasons. He is the word in there. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. I'll, I'll write it up here. You tell me if you like it. And the selfishness of it. See, Hal's pretty, Hal's pretty quick to talk about that. Because you look at Hal and you go, I do you think he's that selfish? I don't think so. I think he's learned to overcome that challenge in life. Maybe as a younger man. We don't know. I didn't know him when he was a younger man. <laughs> but for me, younger. <laughs> for me, the selfishness, whoo, now as a young man, was I selfish? Where's Brother Johnson? He's not even in here today. The one that gave the talk today. Man, spot on, spot on. We learned something about Brother Johnson today in a sacrament talk. We learned that as a younger man, he opted to make some different decisions. And the Lord had to figure out how to bring him back. Is that correct? I don't know what brings you back, brother. Think about it for a moment. In fact, look at the brother next to you. And, and think about the brother next to you. If you have nobody sitting next to you, look all the way down the aisle to that next person. Look down the aisle and look at that next brother and go, what are they struggling with? Do you know? Do you care? Hold on. Hold on. Go one more try. You've got wisdom. I'm done. You've got wisdom. <laughs> You've got wisdom. Share with us, Brother Hill. I just, you left me in the dust. I just wanted to say that when I listened to this, <laughs> that I thought of President Irene at Ritz College sitting near or on the table in the food service eating a peanut butter sandwich with the cousin. And that is who he is. And when he says stuff like this, my mind drifted. I'm sorry to get all those steps. But You're fine. That's where I went. You're fine. I, I don't know. One more thing. Yes. That's why you didn't want to call me. Yeah. You know, <laughs> You need to give us your out call after all that dialogue about your stuff when we're done. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's good. One. That's good. One. That's Don't good one. you do a little? <laughs> well, well, there's voice. Give me that. I don't want to hear that. Well, there's there's voice, but yeah, I know a few of you guys. You know, if I can throw you out of here, if you talk one more time. <laughs> And you know what? I'm not going to argue with you. I might go face to face in just a second. <laughs> <laughs> this lesson, Sorry, this talk is deep. It is as deep as you want to take it. There are so many different ways we could go in this talk. Uh, interesting, this talk is given by a man who's going to die in the next few years. His life is going to be ended. And he started thinking about who he could save. And he didn't direct that to all of us. He shared it with all of us. But he very clearly says in his intro, do I hear his intro? Listen to who he shares it with. And, and listen to what he's projecting. This is pretty cool. Wait, wait, wait. This is it. He's still testifying there. Let's get back down here. Here we go. My beloved brothers and sisters, in this conference, we have been blessed with an outpouring of revelation. Servants of the Lord, Jesus Christ, have spoken and will speak words of truth, encouragement, and direction. I have been touched by the testimonies 
more in this conference that the Lord speaks to us personally through the Holy Ghost as we pray and then He, the Spirit's promptings, we gain greater insights and blessings to guide us through the increasingly difficult days ahead. We have heard again President Russell M. Nelson's warning that in coming days it will not be possible to survive spiritually without the guiding, directing, comforting, and constant influence of the Holy Ghost. How do we describe the days ahead? Pick up on that? What do you say? difficult. And then he, he does a switch. He does a yin and a yang. Where he talks about exciting. And then in the next, what's he say in the next? Listen to this. That prophetic warning has led me to ponder what I might teach my children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren about how to have that crucial guidance in the difficult days ahead for them. So this message today is a brief letter to my descendants that might help them when I am not with them in the exciting days ahead. I want them to know what I have come to know that could help them. I have come to better understand what it will take for them to have the constant influence of the Holy Ghost in the days in which they will live. And I have felt impressed to speak today of my personal experience of inviting the Holy Ghost as nearly as I could to be my, to be my constant companion. My prayer is that I may be able to encourage them. What does he refer to the days ahead? What words did he use? Exciting. He says exciting, right? And then the difficult. Isn't it interesting? The swing, the pendulum swing. Exciting, difficult. Exciting, difficult. If you're going to appreciate true joy, what do you have to appreciate? And yet, he referred to it up there in like the second paragraph up there, that it was uh, a horrible time, just horrible times ahead, and that we would not be able to. He, he talks about the increasingly difficult days ahead, and if we're going to survive spiritually, there's no way we can survive spiritually without the constant companion of the Holy Ghost. If we want to survive spiritually, as opposed to die spiritually, who's in control of that? We are. Do we have, I'm, I'm, I, hold, on, hold on just a moment, okay? Do we have the excuse? Do we get to sit before our foreign president or bishop or state president and say, well, that, that's not my fault. That's not, that, it's not my, I have no control yes, over that. Be. I mean, do we, do we get to do it up? Do we get to cop out? <clears throat> or are we in complete control? 
It is easy to blame somebody else. It is easy to put it off on somebody else. But in this case, who's it come back on? I listened to the talk several times, and each time, just kept thinking, what do I need to change? What do I need to do? How do I need to improve? And I apply that to my work. Officiating, my relationship with my spouse, and my kids who are out of the house now. How do I continue to have good influence on them? And you come back to realizing we have control. There are things we have control of. I talked about officiating walking onto a field. We as umpires give away credibility with wrinkled pants, dirty shoes, dirty mask, looking shabby before we've even called our first pitch or before I've even run up and down the basketball court just by our appearance, which I have total control of. I tell all newer officials, if you do all the things I do to look your best, you'll be able to fool everybody till at least the second inning. They won't know you don't know what you're doing. <coughs> That's where the other part of the equation comes in. <laughs> Increasingly difficult times ahead. Exciting days. Difficult days. He wants to spare his children, grandchildren, his great grandchildren, and everybody after that. Hard times. He wants them to get through it. What's he wanting to have? He wants a companion. It's that simple. So, what do you need to do today to get your record in check? Get you to be able to stand before whomever it is, your priesthood authority, and feel good. You get to make that decision. That's the cool part of the whole thing. And he shares a story in here that is pretty cool. It's about what Brian said. It's about home teaching. He shares the story of how home teachers were able to know beforehand that somebody was in trouble. Let me play that for you. And it's kind of lengthy, but as we go through this, and as you uh, listen to it, I want you to think about whether you would be able to get the promptings that, uh, that these home teachers did. And this is in 12. Let me see. Let me look it up here. Years ago, I received a phone call from a distraught mother. She told me that her daughter had moved far from home. She sensed from the little contact she had with her daughter that something was terribly wrong. She pleaded with me to help. I found out who the daughter's home teacher was. You can tell by that name, but it was a long time ago. I called him. He was young. <coughs> Yet he told me that he and his companion both had been awakened in the night with not only concern for the daughter, but with inspiration that she was about to make choices that would bring sadness and misery. With only that inspiration of the Spirit, they went to see her. At first, she did not want to tell them about her situation. Under inspiration, they pleaded with her to repent and choose the path the Lord had for her. She realized then, I believe by the Spirit, that the only way they could have known what they knew about her life was from God. 
a mother turn her loving concerns over to Heavenly Father and the Savior. The Holy Ghost had been sent to those home teachers because they were willing to serve the Lord. They had followed the counsel and promise found in the Doctrine and Covenants of the Lord. Let thy bowels also be full of charity towards all men and to the household of faith. And let virtue garnish thy thoughts unceasingly. Then shall thy confidence wax strong in the presence of God. And the doctrine of the priesthood shall distill upon thy soul as the dews from heaven. The Holy Ghost shall be thy constant companion, and thy scepter, an unchanging scepter of righteousness and truth, and thy dominion shall be an everlasting dominion, and without compulsory means it shall flow unto thee forever and ever. I encourage each of you to, to want this. What had the daughter forgotten in her life? According to what he shared, if you look through the text, what had she forgotten? And what were the home teachers doing? Uh, the home teachers doing? What did they provide that made her remember? Well, they showed up. They showed up, but she was reluctant. <clears throat> she was reluctant. Oh, what happened to her? Yes, Al. It says right there. Under inspiration, they pleaded with her to repent and choose the path the Lord had for her. She realized then, I believe by the Spirit, that the only way they could have known what they knew about her life was from God. What had she forgotten and was reminded by their inspiration? Think about that. When people lose their way, when we start seeing people less and less in church, what are they forgetting? Yes. That God and Savior most of us. Yes. If you look at the confusion in the world today, especially amongst the youth, they're losing the track that they are sons and daughters of a loving Heavenly Father. And with that confusion, they then lose that track of the fact there is a God that is all-knowing and loves us, and they just need to be reminded or awakened or remembered to that. Had these brethren not shown up, she would have continued with those sheaves of darkness down the path into the transgression, into the sin, and really had a much harder life. She was remembered or reminded that she was a loving daughter of Heavenly Father who cared for her. That's what made the difference in her life. Think about that for a moment, brethren, and I want you to take a self-evaluation, not of who you're ministering to, but of yourself, how easy is it for you to be ministered to? How welcoming are you to your ministering brethren? How well do they know you? When they speak by inspiration, do you hearken, do you listen? My ministering brother, I let him know my family suffered or suffers from pain and agony, physical, and that he may need to be called on at any time to give either myself or my wife a blessing. I drug into church a year ago. I could not even comprehend what was going on in the migraines. The headaches were so bad. I was just in tears. I had to make it through that day. I went to my ministering brother at church. I said, I need a blessing. Yeah, can you help? 
And he said, yes, let's find somebody. Do you know, do you know who he turned to? Pretty interesting, because I didn't even know the man really at that point. Uh, did you stand up again? Stand up again. Turn around. Turn around. Turn around. This good brother, my ministry brother, just said, hey, can you help us out? And he said, okay. You can have a seat. I received a blessing of help that got me through the next six hours that I had to get through. And they didn't understand my agony fully. And they believed that. They were able to bring Heavenly Father's love to me. In the process, I think my situation of willingness to reach out for help and then being able to give it was a blessing in their life. If I recall right, the person giving the blessing said they were inspired to say certain words. Another person that was involved in it said, this is awesome. I'm glad I had the opportunity to do it. The spirit was there because I was willing to reach out to a ministering brother for the help that I needed. Not with any big notice, there was no time for him to go fast. I couldn't make it anymore. That's how bad the agony was. I had a similar experience Monday of this week. That night, the migraines hit at 2 in the morning. The grass was in the bed. The other part of the house for my wife is she had a rest so that she could make it to her employment in the morning. And I'm just in agony. I'm just pleading with him. Pleading. <laughs> hour after hour. Minute after minute. Second by second. I hear her leaving for work in the morning. I'm still down there. Probably. Only about a minute and a half. I hear footsteps coming in. And I have been pleading with Heavenly Father. Please, I can't move. I need water. I need ice pack. I need something. I cannot make it. It was agony, as much agony as you can put me through. I hear footsteps as she's leaving to go back to work after lunch. And nothing I could do. I couldn't move. I couldn't scream. I couldn't do anything. My tears were flowing down. Just agony. And she stopped at the front door. And she came downstairs. And she went into my house. And she said, oh, he must be gone. Right in my office. It's an effect that we never use. She comes walking in. Two reflects. That's all I have. Give me some water. Give me some ice. She got that one that I couldn't do for myself. She was inspired to turn back around to help me. I've been pleading for help for hours. Oh my father, please, just and I got through. I got through. Listen, this is a powerful talk. I told you it would be good for you today, and it would be good for you today. There's so much that each of you are going through, I know nothing about. I don't know what you're struggling with today. I want to have more of you in here sitting next to each other, jabbering, maybe sharing something good that happened. Maybe something that's bad. Maybe something you need help with. We're divided as a brother. Yet, we all have the priesthood and we're loving members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But somehow, I know we can lift each other up. And we can. Drew, I love you. I am so glad. I know a little of the cross that you bear. The pain, the agony, the <coughs> depression. I saw your two little boys today. Cool. It's just awesome. Keep it up. Keep it up. Everything you can do for them. You're blessing in their life. 
go home if you haven't listened to this all of the other coaches we did. Listen to it. You can't understand when he speaks. He just brings the spirit. Just touches your heart. Just makes you want to make some good changes in your life. I leave that with you in the name of Jesus.